Good evening, I'm Carrie. This is Student Loan Chit Chat. It is Thursday, I believe. It was either the first day of spring yesterday or today. I can't quite remember, but we're hitting about 7.30. All right, um, if you are new to this channel, I welcome you. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me on this channel most of the time. Probably about 90% of the time we listen to Dave Ramsey telephone calls. We like to see what we can learn from them. Calls can be as uh, recent as just a few hours ago or even 10 years ago. Because I believe that we can learn from people's debt experiences, mistakes. We can get tips and ideas. All right. And of course, if you are a returning viewer, welcome. You know your family. So curl up and let's chat. We are not going to do a Dave Ramsey phone call today. So hopefully nobody's too disappointed. But the one thing that we are going to discuss is the vehicle purchase and why I got back into debt for it. Now, here's the thing. At first, I was like going, I should break this down into series and stuff. And then I'm like, oh, Jesus, you know, I don't want to spend all my time doing that. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm just going to talk about it. And uh, when I get tired of talking and or you get tired of listening, all right, consider it lesson learned. Um, you may want to break this up into parts. I really don't know. Um, listen as you enjoy it and as you want to listen, uh, come back to it later. This may even be where I talk about, you know, one particular thing one day and then it just naturally flows into something else. So on this channel, I really like to keep it flexible. All right. But let's start from the beginning because I think that's the hardest thing is let's start from the beginning. OK, um, I have to be honest. All right. One thing did kind of give me some humor. All right. Um, this channel, Student Loan Chit Chat, uh, was not a student loan debt channel was a fitness and exercise channel. And I'm telling you, I could get nobody to watch it. Even, even though um, I'm a heavy weight lifter, I've had to lighten up off the 250 pounds, okay, and kind of take it down to, you know, about 185. All right, I can still lift 200. But, uh, you know, with my arthritic knees and stuff, it's real not not really good for at that point. So um, I keep it about 150 range and that seems pretty harmless. Um, and of course, if you're new, I'm, I'm 56 years old. Okay. So about four years ago, maybe pushing five, I'm say probably about four years ago, I uh, started this channel. I couldn't get anybody to watch the fitness stuff. Um, well, it's just, there's just a plethora of fitness channels out there and that, that was fine, whatever. And then I moved into student loan chit chat about two years ago and it was strictly just a, um, I guess just a commentary channel like you're seeing now, except, um, it did not have the, um, videos and, you know, it improved, you know, viewership a little bit. Okay. And then I added in the video videos and it's made it better. Um, if you haven't considered subscribing, I hope you will consider. Um, but then it became, I did it with the videos and stuff. And this channel, as you know, if you're a regular viewer, it cannot be monetized due to the fact that I watch, due to the fact that content like Dave Ramsey or Frontline, PBS, that's all copyrighted material. And um, that information cannot be uh, monetized. So, and that's fine with me. I'm not using this channel for my retirement or anything else. So that's totally fine with me. Also, before I forget, because this is casual conversation this evening, um, because I'm recording this as um, just sort of, a, I guess, sort of podcast style, my knees do need to stand up from time to time. And um, I also don't want to lose a huge chunk of just commentary like this. So probably, you know, in 30 minutes, because we all know what little I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Look, even I, I can even laugh at my own, you know, idiosyncrasies. Okay. That's, that's cool with me. Okay. Um, so I laugh about them. I don't laugh at them. Right. So anyways, um, after 30 minutes, I will pause this just so it saves everything. Cause anybody who's been a YouTube creator, you don't even have to be a YouTube creator, create something. Don't save it along the way, whether you're typing, you're like, oh man, I should have saved it. And there's no way for me to save it as I'm recording it. I have to save and pause, but you won't, you'll, you'll barely notice. It'll seem just like a quick blip in the camera. So it shouldn't be too disruptive to you. But, um, basically, um, how, what the heck was I saying? See it, look at this. I've already forgotten, but basically I was trying to figure out how to, you know, present this. And at first I thought, you know, I could sit down and write all this out into chapters and verses. And I'm like, oh, forget it. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not paid enough to do that. So this is a strictly a uh, channel that is really just 
for the love of sharing ideas and information. Now then, before I get into my car and stuff, oh, I remember what I was saying. Um, it, so, so it started out as a fitness channel, then it moved into student loan debt. And my passion, honestly, is student loan debt. That That is first and foremost what I love. But, you know, there, there isn't that much student loan debt news going on all the time that it justifies, you know, regular uploading and stuff. Um, also, I'm no financial person. I'm no accountant. I'm just a, a little humble school teacher who's just had a whole lot of financial mistakes in the past. Okay. Um, that includes a bankruptcy at about 24, 25 off of credit card debts it includes a second bankruptcy off of a car uh, repossession when I went from a what was a Nissan, uh, a Nissan Sentra and thought, gee, let's be stupid and upload an up an upgrade to a Nissan Maxima. And then that led to the next bankruptcy at 32. Okay. So with that aside, all right, this channel is really just to share my experiences. There are lots and lots of channels out there where we can debate who's right and who's wrong. Um, this is not that channel. The reason I won't debate it is because the purpose of my channel is not to convince you that I'm right. Okay. If the purpose were of my channel was to convince you that I'm right, then I would sit and debate all of this. There are tons and tons of channels, um, that will debate it with you because they're trying to convince you. I'm not trying to convince you now that you can disagree all you want, by all means, put it in the chat. It probably makes it more exciting. Okay. Um, I, I'll put a heart by just about everything. Okay. Um, a heart doesn't necessarily mean I agree, disagree. A heart simply means I read it. Um, it's my way of acknowledging to you that I saw it. Um, but it does not necessarily mean agree, disagree. It simply means, Hey, you know what? I want to recognize that you stopped by, you shared your thoughts. And as long as the thoughts aren't offensive and then we're all adults here. So I think we kind of have an idea, you know, as to what offensive is at this point. Okay. But disagreement in of itself, Hey, you know, share, share your thoughts because th this is how we learn. It's just, I'm not willing to debate to convince you that I'm right because I've made too many mistakes. But what I do try to do and what I want to do with telling you my story about why I chose to get back into debt, yada, yada. Okay. With this car is I want to give you, I want to give you my thought process because I think so oftentimes when people have debt, um, we, we know they have debt, but we're struggling to understand the thought process as to how they got there. What happened? And in some of my earlier channels, when I talk about, um, the shopping addiction that I had, I give you that thought process. What was going on in my head? What was it I was trying to achieve? So what I want to do is I want to share with you the thought process as to why, you know, I would pick up a $26,000 spanking new car. How did I do it? Cause I am just one school teacher income. Okay. Um, how'd I do it? And I know the questions that people have, you know, how, how, how did you pull it off? How long? I, I know people are asked, how'd you pull it off? How long your payments? How long you've been planning this? Why were you stupid to do this? You were debt free, yada, yada. I, I get it. I get it. Okay. And I will attempt to address those. And like I said, I will need to take breaks, but it'll be just a blip on your screen is all it will be. Okay. You probably won't even notice it except for a quick shift in the camera. All right. So anyways, with that lengthy introduction, if you know, if you're new to this channel, this is a very casual channel. Okay. Um, so feel free to put in your ideas, your thoughts, your sharing, agree, disagree. I, I generally, it, it doesn't bother me. I teach middle school. It don't bother me. Agree, disagree. Okay. But I will not debate because like I said, the purpose of this channel is not for me to convince you that I'm right. And it never has been. The purpose of this channel is to share with you why I do what I do. And I will share with you the mistakes that I've made that I believe were detrimental to me financially, emotionally, and what I've done to get myself out of it. All right. So anyways, I say we go ahead and pour that tea. I forgot my teacup. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and pour the tea anyways. Let's pour. Well, that's really silent about the teacup effect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, I'm Carrie. This is Student Loan Chit Chat. Thank you so much for joining me. All right, let's go ahead and let's start from the beginning. And like I said, um, th this may be broken up into multiple nights, whatnot. We we'll just let the conversation go as it as it flows. 
you know, as I get tired, whatever. Okay. All right. Let's, let's step back. Um, tw- so just Sunday, I purchased a $26,000 ba- brand spanking new six miles on it. Uh, 2024 Toyota Corolla hybrid. All right. Um, absolute love the hybrid. For those who don't know, the hybrid does not have an alternator. It does not have a belt. It does not have a starter. All right. Also for the hybrid, um, it's recommended you don't put a crap load of heavy stuff on the back seat because underneath it is a big, big, big battery compartment. Okay. Or something kind of like a battery apartment, I think underneath, underneath there. All right. Also, um, I believe that's in my model. Also with the hybrid, for those who may not know, yeah, I did my research on this stuff. For those who may not know, if you have a hybrid, do not jumpstart a non-hybrid car. So you have a hybrid, which is part electric, part gas. Do not jumpstart a non-hybrid car. So, car. so all those, you know, those times somebody goes, ah, can I, you know, can you give me a jump? You must say no, unless it's hybrid to hybrid. And even then, I'll be totally honest, I probably still wouldn't do it um, just simply because there are more steps to go through. Okay. So just some quick tips and advice on a hybrid. All right. Um, my car was $26,000, which was about three, 4,000 under manufacturer price. All right. So I'm going to write this down here because sometimes I forget things. And like I said, this is probably going to be broken into multiple uh, sessions because I could yak for forever. Um, good or bad. I think my mother at times thought it was probably a blessing and a curse, right? Okay. So I bought that car just Sunday and um, traded in the lease that I had. All right. So I had a lease car, which was a Toyota Corolla, not the hybrid, but I had a regular lease car. So let's start about, let's talk about why did I lease? I think that might be a good starting point. Why did I lease? So, well, let's just go back about six years. Okay, because I turned in my lease car early this week. So let's go back six years. Um, I was divorcing almost 10 years ago. Okay, no secret on this channel. Okay, he left. Um, That's his right. So he decided to end the marriage. Not all women in the marriage. I know statistics say that, but it's not always true. All right. So um, he he decides in in the marriage and the what I got in the marriage. And I mean, truly, the only thing that I got was a 10 year old vehicle. Okay, was a. use Lincoln Mountaineer. My entire life, I'm 56 right now, I'll be 57 in July. So my entire life from the ages of 19 to respectively 51. Okay. From the ages of 19 to 51, respectively, I, um, had only bought used vehicles. All right. Um, keep in mind that my first vehicle was when I was 17 and it was a Nissan B210, no, yeah, it was a Datsun. By, I think it was by Nissan, okay? Datsun B210 hatchback, okay? Like you could repair it literally, you know, at your neighbor's, you know, on your neighbor's driveway, okay? Just, it was just a real simple, basic Datsun B210 hatchback that was in the 19, about mid 1980s. I, I had always been taught you never buy a new car. This, this was the rule of, everything I've ever, ever been taught. Never buy a new car. Always, always buy a used car by three to four years old. Drive it, drive it, drive it, yada, yada, yada. Okay. I'd done that my whole entire life. Um, and well, and and always buy the good brands, Toyota, Honda. Okay. I mean the, the big stuff, Nissan. All right. Um, and th- I'd always followed that rule because that's just what I had always been taught. So let's go back about 10 years. I get divorced. I get a Lincoln Mountaineer, which turned out, I don't even think they make them anymore. And it turned out to be an absolute crap piece of SUV. All right. So you're talking after I got divorced, I think I pumped seven, five, uh, maybe six, six to seven thousand, thousand dollars into that car over about six years. The interior looks great. The interior was beautiful. The car was just a piece of crap. It's an SUV, but uh, you know, you understand what I'm saying. It was also a V8. 
um, seated eight and all that. I, I didn't need all that as, a, as just a single school teacher. But at the time, okay, it was supposed to be used to haul, you know, my ex-husband's business and crap around and all that stuff, all right? So I had this vehicle I, I didn't need anymore, okay? And that, that was what I got in the divorce. We each walked away with, the, you know, with our own debt and stuff and all of that, okay? And I had been stuck on the side of the road probably more times in that SUV than I had been stuck in from the ages of 20, 30s, and, 40, and 40s. Because I got divorced, it was, I was about 46, 47, okay? I had been stuck on the road for everything. Smoke's coming out of the front, all right? Uh, that engine check light keeps going on. Well, it turns out that that um, vehicle, the Lincoln Mountaineer, I think especially the one made in 2006, which is the one that I had, because um, I looked it up. It turned out to be one of the crappiest vehicles. It was made by Lincoln, okay, ever, and I don't believe they even make them anymore. I could be wrong, so don't hold me to it, but I don't think they do. And I remember going to my mechanic, and I said, man, I said, you know, I, I, I'm just sick of these payments. This car just takes a ton of work. And he said to me, he goes, these V8 SUVs, he said, you can plan on minimum, he said, 15 to maybe two grand a year. Now, here's the thing. People will say, oh, man, you know, I took my car 400,000 miles and I didn't have to do crap to it. Okay, that, that, I think some of that's a little hyperbolic. Personally, I think they over-exaggerate just a little bit, but I will take the word of some people. That's all we had to do is oil, lube, and filter. I'm sure it exists out there somewhere. Okay, but like I said, I think some of it is a bit hyperbolic. But either way, either way, the problem is that I don't know how to maintain a car. See, anything is easy if you have the knowledge, the tools, equipment, and all that to do it. So when someone says, well, all you need to do is just do that oil lube and filter yourself. That's great. Do you know how to do it? Because if you don't know how to jumpstart a car, and I've met people who can't do that, and I can at least do that, all right? So, and yes, I can check my oil after someone shows me where the dipstick is, okay? Um, and I won't discuss the fi five minutes it took to figure out how to open the uh hood of my vehicle because I kept reaching my hand underneath hood I'm like going I know there's I know there's a flappy switch or something here okay so clearly I am not the most mechanically um, inclined person all right so I had to be honest about that and that was not hard to be honest that was a very shallow wading pool there and I had to be really honest and I had to go Gary you don't maintain your own cars I don't have the tools the knowledge the equipment the manpower I, I can't do it and one of the things that I guess you could say I figured out, you know, not that it was difficult is look, the budget that you go on has to match your capabilities. So somebody can say to you, oh, well, you know, get a used car and just maintain it yourself. But if you don't have that capability, it's not going to matter. You don't have the capability to do it. You don't have the connections. You don't have the know-how. So, so before you make a financial decision based on what other people say, you must first make sure that you have those capabilities to do it on your own. Okay. I can't create a budget. I realized on a used car, if I don't have the technology and the tools and the know-how, and even you have the desire and the will to do the physical labor to maintain that car. So somebody's saying, oh, well, get a used car and, you know, you just need to do this, this and this. And, you know, it's cheap because the body shop's charging you 200, but the parts only, you know, 75. Just do it yourself. Well, that doesn't do you any good now if you don't know how to do it. Right. So one of the things I learned in getting used vehicles is you cannot buy a used vehicle based on what talent other people have to maintain their used vehicle. Okay. When I was married, my ex could maintain the vehicles. He could take an engine apart, damn near, and put the sucker back together. Yeah. Okay. In the driveway. <laughs> All right. I don't have that skill and talent. So was that advice of buy a used vehicle um, and just kind of do most of the maintenance yourself apply to me today? No. It doesn't apply to me, all right? Not not in today's day and age, and it never has, all right? The other thing, so 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 staying on staying on track here to the best of my ability, um, I I realized that when it came to my being now on my own, you know, I I didn't have a spouse to call and say come bail me out. Although I've always had AAA, I've always carried some sort of you know. I just think everybody, man or woman, it doesn't matter. And yes, I have been stu stuck. Um, I got stuck once years ago, okay, 
probably like 15, 20 years ago on a dark freeway. I kid you not. And at 11 p.m. and AAA came and saved me. All right. But one of the things I realized is I was my car, the SUV. OK, I probably, I'll try to say SUV because I'm talking about the SUV, the Lincoln Mountaineer SUV. It was stressing me the hell out. And I kept it for probably about three, four years. Cause I've been, yeah, cause I've been divorced for 10. I've been leasing for five. You know, I use my fingers when I count. Okay. I'm not embarrassed to admit it, it is what it is. Okay. I've been doing it since I was like 10. So I, yeah. So about the first four years, you know, I went ahead and I kept the um, SUV. And then one day I just got stuck again. And I think it was the third fourth time. I wasn't used to driving vehicles that got my ass stuck every six months on the side of a road. The vehicle was so bad. And it's not because I didn't maintain it. It's not because we didn't maintain it. Like I said, we bought it used. Okay. Um, and I think it probably had like, I don't know, 70, 80,000 miles on or something like that. Okay. But I mean, the appearance was beautiful. So it was not a beat up. I, I've never driven clunkers, so to speak. I've just driven, always driven very economical cars. I've come a couple times to driving a clunker um, when I was married. Okay. So basically I'd had this vehicle, uh, this, this SUV, and I was drained. And part of the reason I was drained is I was just going through a divorce. All right which is emotionally draining as anyone who's ever gone through one is. Well, it is for most people. Some people, it's a huge relief and they have a party. I guess it depends on whatever side it is, but that's not the point. So for me, it was very, very emotionally draining. I was also feeling very insecure in the sense that, look, you know, I, I can't have a car that I can't even take out of Tampa. I could not take this SUV out of Tampa. Here I am. My ass is in a V8 SUV. Looks gorgeous. Was beautifully maintained. It's just the, the engine didn't run well. It was built poorly. OK, um, I, I was afraid to take it to Orlando, which is like an hour, hour and a half up the road because I was genuinely afraid I was going to get stuck. So I wouldn't go anywhere. I would only stay in town. And every time I got into the damn car and got it out of the shop, it was like, you know, it's OK. Seb's bring this huge sigh of relief of, phew, OK, the car's fixed. We're good for at least, you know, maybe a year or two. No, in my mind, it was great. I'm probably, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be four months before I have to go back and do the shop before a check engine light goes on, whatever. What was going on through my head is I was tired. I was part tired and I was part scared. I was tired of, of a vehicle that I felt was just draining my pocketbooks. I was scared because I was divorced and, you know, very alone out here in Tampa, no family out here. Um, and I was very scared, emotionally scared all of that. I mean, yeah, I have my job and, you know, my friends and stuff like that. But, you know, when I stepped away from work, you know, who do I have to call? Okay. It wasn't going to be Ghostbusters. That's for sure. Right. So I realized at that time, 10 years ago, what I wanted more than anything is I wanted, oh boy, I'm going to hate to use John's terms here in, um, Dave Ramsey, but guys, I wanted to feel safe again. I, I, I didn't want a commitment, so to speak, in the sense of, you know, <coughs> I want to buy a car and it's going to be the car that I drive for 10 years. And I, I didn't want that. I, I, I just wanted my structure back. You know, I had moved out of my house, moved into an apartment. I was dealing with a piece of, you know, crap car. Um, you know, that that's, that's, that's what I was going through. <coughs> and what I really, really wanted was I wanted to feel safe. And my vehicle did not make me feel safe. But at the same time, I didn't want a commitment to anything either. I, I didn't want a commitment to a car. I, I just didn't want it. Um, cause I wasn't, you know, a lot of us, when we go through a divorce, we're not necessarily all right in the head right away. Okay. We, we have to adjust. We have to go through that shock and awe period, yada, yada. And, um, after four years of trying to deal with this vehicle and trying to make it work and being very responsible, I'm a very responsible vehicle owner. I always have been, even when my cars were leaking oil, Okay. On the ground. But then at the time I was married to someone who could fix that leaking oil on the ground. Okay. I realized I'm not in a position to do that. And, um, I decided, you know what? I just want to solve the problem right now. <coughs> and the way, <coughs> excuse me. And the way that I saw solving that problem, as I said, you know what? And I'd work to improve my credit also. All right. Remember, keep in mind at this time. Okay. Um, 
about six years ago, I had I had student loan debt of one hundred and ten thousand until it was forgiven in twenty twenty two. But at the time, you know, I had a student loan debt. Um, I was uh, still living in my apartment. I had not yet purchased a condo. Okay, but what I needed more than anything was I needed stability. And I remember one day I was at work, and I don't remember why 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 was I thought of this, but I thought, you know. If I could, and I did the math, for all the money that I spent on car repairs, I mathematically figured out I could have leased a car for the entire three freaking years. Now, keep in mind, I've spent about $6,000 in car repairs over four years. And I actually did the math because I had seen a lot of lease ads. And I'm, you know, I'm like my age, you know, I'm familiar with leasing to some extent. I'm very familiar with it now, but you have to go back six years, okay? And I literally did the math and I thought, damn, I may not own the car, but I could have leased a brand spanking new car and felt safe. Yes, I am borrowing from John. So feel free to chuckle if we need to. Okay, I get it. And I, and I was just flabbergasted because I'm like, I went, when I sat down, I did the math and I'm like, holy cow. The 6000 that I spent on a car repairs in four years, that stressed me the hell out. I realized I could have just leased a car. And yeah, I understand what people like Ramsey think leasing is fleecing. But like I said, I'm not here to convince you that what I did was right or wrong. I, I'm here to tell you the thought process that was going through my mind so that you get an idea and go, ah, okay, now I see. I was so stressed out. And again, like I said, I'm dealing with divorce. And I've got a car that just won't stop going to the mechanic. And I have an awesome mechanic. I don't go to the dealership for my mechanics. Okay, I don't. Um, and I said, you know. I would just like to breathe. I know. I feel like I'm borrowing this from John. It is what it is. Okay. John of Dave Ramsey. What I needed, I realized at that time, six years ago, was I needed stability. I needed to stop the freaking conveyor belt that was going on in my life. That was just nonstop turning. It's like, you know, you, you, you take one thing off the conveyor belt and then you're supposed to take the next thing. You're supposed to keep up with the conveyor belt like an assembly line. And I just kept going and going and going. And the conveyor belt was going faster and faster and I couldn't stop it. I could not stop it. And um, I actually remember I was sitting at work and I asked myself, Carrie, what do you need? What What could make the conveyor belt stop? What could make it so that you feel like you're in control because I felt so much like I was out of control. You know, I, 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 I didn't ask to have the changes happening that were happening. It's just, it's life. It happens. Okay. Um, and I said, you know what I'd really like? I said to myself, I would just like a car that works. That's all that I wanted was a car that works. I didn't want to own a car for forever and ever. Okay, not that day, that time. I wasn't looking for the car of my dreams. I wasn't looking to impress anybody with a great set of wheels. I still don't look to do that. I just wanted, part of it I wanted to stop was the hurt. I, I wanted it to stop. And I didn't know how to get it to stop. But I, but I, I felt like my life was just getting out of control. When people say that leasing is horrible, that it's the most careless way to spend money, I can tell you that it actually saved me. It allowed me to stop the conveyor belt that was just kicking my ass. It allowed me to go, everybody just time, time. Put me into a car that I can freaking drive without it dying on me. Put me into a car that if I want to drive from here to home in Oregon, I can do it. Put me in a car if I want to go to upstate New York, if I want to go down south to the Keys, wherever the hell I want to go, let me go there. Because having a vehicle that I couldn't drive around in, I felt more stuck than I already feel stuck. You know, you ever feel at times like you're on the same damn street, you're going up and down, doing the same freaking routine and nothing changes. 
and you want something to change. Leasing a car at the time that I did it, four years after I got divorced, and I was now in my very early 50s, it was single-handedly, I believe, one of the greatest things I did for myself emotionally. Because you see, at the time, like I said, I still had $110,000 student debt. I, I, I still had these things. But leasing a car allowed me to just focus. It gave me a sense of reward in the sense that I'm free. I'm not stuck in freaking Tampa with the inability to leave. I, I can drive away if I want. I can go somewhere else. I can take this car above, you know, beyond 20 miles, you know, from where I live. It was the very first sense of freedom that I had had <coughs> four years after getting divorced. You see, something I've learned, what is bad timing or a bad season for one person isn't necessarily a bad season for someone else. It was my time to lease a car. And trust me, when I was 50 and I decided that I was going to lease a car, I, I remember thinking to myself, I'm breaking every freaking rule that I have ever read about leasing. Leasing is horrible. Yet you're not, you know, if, if you did this instead of that, you know, if you, if, if you just bought a car, you know, and did that instead of leasing, you'd have more money. You know, if you put the money that, that you're going to waste, you know, into three years of leasing and you put 10% of that into a mutual fund that gives you 7%, yada, yada, yada. I didn't care about any of that. I didn't care about any of that. The only thing that I cared about when I leased was I wanted the pain that I was feeling partly from my divorce. I wanted the pain that I was feeling trapped. Okay. And remember I had $110,000 student loan. So I already to some extent was trapped, but now I felt even further trapped because I couldn't even drive out of the city because this vehicle just wasn't strong enough. Yeah, it was a V8, but the, the engine was horrible. Too many repairs. I, wa I, wanted, I wanted freedom. I wanted freedom. So I did about a month's worth of research. Yeah, I did. And I used to be a librarian um, in, a, in, in a little newspaper. Researching is my knack. You want to find out any information? Trust me, I can find it for you. I'm very good at researching. All right. Um, I, I just wanted the pain to stop. And I wanted a sense of freedom. And I said, I did about three weeks of researching before I decided to lease the car. And I mean, when I tell you I research, and I know I've said it before on this channel, for those who may be regular viewers, when I tell you I researched it, I researched it with an open mind. See, part of what happens is people won't, have an open mind to a different financial path than what mainstream media tells them. People won't open up their mind to it because mainstream media said this because their favorite celebrity said this because their favorite financial guru said this. Okay. As much as I absolutely love Dave Ramsey, I wish he knew my channel existed. I'm sure he doesn't know it exists. Okay. I'm just a little, you know, pea pod, but that's okay. You know, um, I'm just a, I'm a huge fan of his, but it still doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything. Because something I learned is when it comes to something like leasing, a lot of, of leasing, at least for me, it was emotion. It wasn't about the money. See, what happens is when we criticize leasing, we're criticizing it from a financial standpoint. We, we go, what a waste of money. Carrie, you just made five and a half years worth of car payments. You could have freaking bought a car. You're right. You are absolutely right. I could have bought a car, but you see what I couldn't buy was the emotional stability that I needed. So I could get a car that I actually wanted. What I could not buy was the feeling of pain that was going on inside of me, the hurt that I had going on inside of me. What I could not buy, even with buying a car that might be considered a better deal than leasing, what I could not buy was the freedom that I wanted to be able to go anywhere. 
But we're not talking physical. We're not talking financial. We're talking mental. You see, so much of money, you guys, I'm convinced, is mental. Sometimes I think the failure of money or the success of money has less to do with the financial aspect and more to do with the mental. But because we can't get into somebody's brain to see what's going on in their head, and this is reflected a lot in the Dave Ramsey phone calls, it's been reflected in my own life experience, because we can't see that, it, we can't put a dollar value on it. But what would happen if I said to you, it was more valuable for me to lease a car for five and a half years because the wealth that I gained, the self-esteem that I gained was more important to me than anything you could possibly put on a dollar. There was no investment. There was no car you could give me six years ago when I leased that was going to take me mentally where I needed to go. So trying to convince me at that time that, oh, Carrie, leasing is a horrible idea. You're going to lose money. It wasn't the loss of money that I was focused on. It wasn't the loss of money that I cared about. It wasn't whether or not I leased a car, bought a car, what type of car. That wasn't my focus. My only focus, especially coming from my past, I was born in orphanage in Vietnam. I was severely traumatized. I was concerned about my mental state of health. That's what I was concerned about. I didn't give a crap about whether or not the car I bought was going to, well, you know, if you buy it right now, it's going to have a better interest rate. So why you lease car? Didn't care about that. You see, if you, if, if even in the Dave Ramsey calls that we listen to, if I could get inside the mindset, see the mindset that I understand, so I, might, I have, understand the mindset of the shopping addict because I lived that for, you know, damn near a decade. But if I could get into the mindset of a lot of these calls, what we would learn, what would be so fascinating. If you stepped into my mind at the time that I leased, there is no way you'd have ever had me purchase a car because you would have understood that what I was looking for could not be written out on some freaking contract line about, well, now your payments are going to be this and you're going to have the car for the next 10 years. You're going to do this, this, and this. That's not where I was at. I needed to sense freedom. I needed mental freedom. I didn't need a commitment. Sometimes the mental ability to know that I can change my mind and leave, that can be worth way more to me in dollars. My mental health can be worth more to me in dollars than the actual dollar bill. When it comes to leasing, there's to me, a season when things like leasing, renting a car, excuse me, renting a apartment. Okay. Th th there are seasons, you know, there, there are people who bought houses. If they added up the number of years they rented, was that a waste of money? Was it? What happens if that young person needed to rent for a while? They weren't sure where they wanted to settle. They weren't sure where their job was going to be. They weren't sure you know, if they would fall in love with somebody in that city, in that place. In other words, the season for them to rent was that time. Would they look back at that experience and go, man, you know, that was a waste of money renting. Now we are separating. It's important that you understand that we are separating people who are doing things, dealing with what's going on in their head. Versus people who are just simply going out and buying stuff. When I was a shopaholic, I was just going out and buying crap. I had a mental illness and I was going out and buying stuff. It was very different. Fast forward, okay, to my mid to late 40s when I got divorced. I needed to protect myself mentally. Having a car that was constantly dying was stressing me out so bad. I should say so badly. So I called up 
Toyota. And um, I said, my credit score is 750. And I had worked to get my credit score a, a year earlier because I knew that I, I decided I wanted to start leasing. You want to start leasing, guys, you really need to get a high credit score. I'm going to say minimum 750. I know they'll take you, I've heard, you know, 670, but your rates are just aren't going to be as good. I'm going to tell you 750 especially if you want to go with some of these, you know, bigger companies, a 750 score is pretty darn solid. Um, some, it might not even be high enough. Okay. But just, just, just as a bar marker. Okay. Um, so I had started planning about a year before I leased that I would go ahead and lease. And when I hit around the 750 score, I was so proud of it because I had worked so hard to get it up there. I called and I actually, long story short, just, or in my case, long story long, right? Um, I called and I got pre-approved and I got into my first Toyota Corolla, not the hybrid that I purchased. I got into my first Toyota Corolla lease. I will tell you that when I got into that leased car, it was the fir first time I'd ever driven. Um, no, it was the second time I stand correct. It was the second time I'd ever driven a new car because the first time I drove a new car was the Nissan Sentra in my early thirties. And I was stupid. I think I kept that sucker for three weeks. And then moved up to the maxima, couldn't afford it, duh, okay, and then um, lost it, all right. Um, that's not the emotional and mental mindset that this lease came with. So here I am, I finally get into my first lease six years ago, just shy of six years ago, because I leased for total five and a half years. I got, I got into my first lease six years ago. And um, I remember calling up one of my friends, and I said to her, if I had known just how free I felt in a vehicle that I didn't feel trapped in anymore. And if I had known that it helped me bring on a new phase of my life, you know, kind of like getting rid of the car from the last relationship, not say that that's necessary. Okay. But in this case, I, it was necessary because the car didn't work very well. The SUV didn't work really well. I said, if I had known, just how good this was going to feel. I said I would have done it the day right after I'd gotten divorced. And what I meant by that was I was finally in a car that I could go anywhere I wanted. That sense of freedom that I was looking for, that I needed. It was like the bars had come down. No, you're not trapped to where you can't even go from Tampa to Orlando and Orlando's only a stinking hour away, respectively. You, you can go. You want to go there? Go, go. I actually had to ch change my mind. I had to change my mindset about how, about my freedom. It, it, I felt like a prisoner who had just finally stepped out of jail. And the prisoner goes, I can go left, right, north, south, east, west. Where, where should I go? It was literally like chains and maybe it was even part chains of marriage who knows it was like chains had just completely come off I don't think if I had to count in my whole entire life some of the greatest emotional events that I've ever had now I've never I'm not a parent so I can't say it was you know having a child okay but as a non-parent okay it, leasing a car, in my experience for my life, stands as the top two. Yes, top two most emotionally changing experiences. Part of it's because of coming out of divorce and dealing, like I said, with a vehicle that just wasn't good. That made me feel trapped. So here I am. I'm already getting divorced. I've already been dumped, so to speak. And it happens. Okay, whatever. All right. Um, I, I'm in this little apartment. She's even smaller than the 840 square foot I have here. Again, that's fine. Whatever. But I, I, I didn't feel like I had anything. I didn't feel like I had anything. Okay. And it was work of, you know, routine of going to work, coming home, going to work, coming home. I mean, you know. Um, so I leased a car. And when I tell you the emotion was just overwhelming, it happened almost instantaneously. I'd say within days of leasing a car. And it was the first time I'd ever driven a new car, ever. I'd never driven a, 
new car. I mean, I mean, like I said, said you know, aside from the Nissan Sentra that I did for three weeks in my early 30s, okay? But like I said, that was for different mental, emotional reasons. But I just remember going, I remember, literally remember thinking I'm free and I'm still carrying $110,000 student loan, but I also knew that the student loan was going to eventually be free. It would eventually, you know, go away as well. And it did in 2022 through loan forgiveness. But when people talk about how leasing is bad and it sucks, if you make your financial decisions only based on the dollar bill, you may find that you're actually leaving out a lot of your mental health in the process. And sometimes to save your mental health, it you may have to spend more. You know, Dave Ramsey... On the Dave Ramsey show, they call it the stupid tax when sometimes you got to break a CD or whatever because, you know, you got to pay the stupid tax to get rid of this bill. Because it deals with my mental health, I don't like to call it the stupid tax, but let's just call it that if, if that helps people to relate to it. Sometimes you got to pay that bill. You got to pay that extra cost. But if in paying that extra cost, it helps you solve a mental health issue that is eating at you does the price of what it take to do that does it really matter would it have been better for me to have spent five hundred dollars a month sitting on a psychiatrist couch can i get that money back is that a waste because after all you got better again so was that a waste of money you know i didn't need to spend all that money on that psychiatrist couch i could have just called my gal pals for free instead so why'd you spend the money on the psychiatrist couch? Because there was something there, because I've had a psychiatrist, of course, okay, years and years ago, because there's something there that nobody else can give you. There's something there that nobody else can help you with. So you spend the extra money to do it. You spend the extra money to see that health counselor. You spend the extra money to go to that gym that makes you feel a little bit better about yourself. You spend that extra money because you know that in the long run, it's going to serve you 10 times better, even though it might cost more at the time. You know that deep inside, it is going to serve you 10 times better than if you tried to take the cheaper route. Taking the cheaper route doesn't always work. Why do parents pay buco bucks for their kids to attend private school when you've got passionate teachers like me that teach in public school? It's not so bad if I teach your kid, is it? Is it so bad if I teach your children? Are you rejecting me because I teach public school? You think I'm not good enough? No, you're not rejecting me. And I don't ever feel like you're rejecting me. You're putting your child where you believe is going to maximize their mental health, their physical health, their future financial well-being. Well, what if I told you that perhaps many people, perhaps more than we know, that lease a vehicle are doing it for the exact same reason? Would that change your mind? Does it change your mind to know that I leased a vehicle, not because I was trying to get the best deal on the car, but I leased it because I needed help and I was slipping. I was financially slipping, a vehicle I can't afford. I'm emotionally slipping. I'm breaking. And what have I told you? A leased vehicle changed it. It reassured me, told me everything's going to be okay. It told me to keep driving forward. It told me, don't look in the rear view mirror too much. Would it change what you think of leasing a vehicle? Does it change it? It's not always about the money. It's not always about, well, you could have gotten more if you stuck that money in a mutual fund. Yeah, I, I, I could be driving off. Of, I could I, I, I could be in a paid car already. Sure, I could. Absolutely, I could. But you see, that's not what I wanted at the time. It wasn't what I needed at the time. I was hurting. And I needed it to stop. 
I had no idea when I leased a vehicle that, I mean, if I didn't love Toyota before, hell, I have a Toyota hat now. <laughs> I actually have a black Toyota hat with an emblem, with the Toyota emblem on it. If, if I had known when I first got divorced, what I know now about how leasing a vehicle can help improve you emotionally, I would have done it years ago. And Scouts Honor, I've told that to a couple of my very closest and dearest friends. I've got, if I had known, it was like I was keeping myself in a cycle of hurt and I didn't even know I could get the F out. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know I could. Stop looking at every financial move you make in your life just based on the dollar. You did not waste time in that relationship if you learned something from it. You did not waste time living in that house if you gained some value out of it. You didn't waste time in that job if it taught you something you didn't know before. You didn't even waste time with that person even though the relationship didn't work out if you learned something about you that made yourself better. Leasing a vehicle was one of the greatest decisions I have ever made in my entire financial life. Zero regrets. Zero regrets. And um, oh, there was much more emotion behind it, behind that lease. It wasn't about the dollar. I think many of the financial things that we do in life, many of the financial decisions we make, we get in trouble at times because there is so much emotion behind it. There's so much emotion behind that house that we were raised in. We don't want to give up even though we can't afford it. Right? We did a story on that not too long ago on bedtime chit chat story time, right? We get that we 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 get that truck because that truck makes us feel powerful even though we can't afford it. I was very fortunate I could afford the lease vehicle. I did not lease based on flashy. I leased a Toyota Corolla. As a matter of fact, when I called the dealership, I said, I want you to give me the cheapest Toyota Corolla I can possibly lease. See, I wasn't looking for flashy and I still wasn't looking for flashy. I mean, come on, guys. I bought a Toyota Corolla hybrid. Yeah, okay. It's a little bit bougie there, I guess. But I still kept it to a Toyota Corolla hybrid. All right. And I literally said to them, I said, I want you to give me the cheapest car that I can possibly lease. Because to me, vehicles are from point A to point B. I, I don't need to impress you. I really don't. What I wanted, though, is I wanted to go from point A to point B anywhere I wanted to go when I wanted to go. I wanted to be able to take it out of state. I wanted to be able to drive it all the way across country if I feel like it. I didn't want to be limited. And I didn't want it to control me. Because I felt like so many other parts of my life were out of control and leasing allowed me to do that. When you get the backstory of why people do the things they do and you're willing to keep an open mind, I really think that it helps to shape your perspective. Not that you agree but that you come to an understanding of, wow, I never really thought of it like that. I had always been told that leasing was bad, that it was a horrible financial decision. But my instincts told me it was the right thing to do. That's what my instincts told me. And when I added up all the money I'd spent on repairs, I figured out that I could lease a car for the entire three years and I would still have money left over. And as I, like I said, as I lease, you know, um, when I lease that car, it taught me that life can still move forward. But just be careful. You don't look in the rear view, rear view mirror too much. Always be looking forward because you never know what's ahead. And greater days are ahead. I'm Carrie. This is Do Loan Chick Chat. I think that's enough for this evening. I will uh, come back and talk about the finances of the vehicle and all that stuff, but uh, I think that's enough for tonight. So this is why I leased. 
I hope you will consider subscribing. You guys have a great night.